Uh, we met, I think, when I was here in last February. Hi, Kevin Ard. Nice to meet you. Hi. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a good time to come. <laughs> Great. <clears throat> <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to our interim and grand round. Today is absolute pleasure to have uh, my favorite colleague, Dr. Kevin Art, who is the director of sexual sexual health clinic at M at MGH. He also associate director of the OPAD program there. He is assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. USF has a privilege to have this uh, collaboration with him through the Sylvie Rattel PTC to scale up PrEP in Florida and Suffolk County, Massachusetts. But certainly Florida has small problems. And actually, Dr. Art is one of the early physicians that have seen MPOX in the US. So um, we are so lucky to have him to speak to us about MPOX, about his experience and what we have learned. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation to be here. It's great to be here. Can you all hear me okay? Excellent. Um, so uh, I realized that case counts are significantly down for MPOX, which is wonderful. But I think it's actually a good time to debrief and to think about what we've learned from this outbreak. And so I'll be sharing my perspectives on lessons learned as a clinician who was involved in the response. Of this outbreak. And these will be both things about the virus and then I think also things about outbreak response in general um, that we also learned, I think, in prior outbreaks, COVID being one example, but um, are reminded of in the context of this outbreak. This is my disclosure. In terms of the learning objectives for this session, um, first we'll talk about the epidemiologic trajectory of the global MPOX outbreak. I'll summarize some factors that I think favored emergence of MPOX now, um, and then also talk about those factors that I think contributed to its control. And then we'll identify 10 key lessons from the MPOX outbreak. Um, first, a note on terminology. Um, the name monkeypox was given in 1958, actually, when this virus was identified in a colony of laboratory monkeys in Copenhagen, Denmark. Um, but that name is inaccurate in many ways. Um, it's thought that the environmental reservoir of this infection is not monkeys, but rather rodents um, in Africa. And many people also experience this name as stigmatizing. And so the World Health Organization announced a new name for the illness, mpox, in November of 2022 with a one-year transition period to this new name. And so I'll be um, using the name MPOX throughout um, this presentation. 
The viral clades themselves had actually already been renamed. Um, they used to be called the Congo Basin clade and the West African clade, and those are now known as clades one and clades two, respectively. Um, the Congo, uh, the clade one has a higher case mortality rate, which is the one in that was involved in this outbreak, um, has a much lower um, case fatality rate. Um, so let's go back to the beginning for a moment and talk about how um, this outbreak became apparent and then what happened since. On May 7th of 2022, um, a case of MPOX was identified in England. And this was in a person who had traveled to Nigeria and was thought to have acquired the infection there. Um, and there had been sporadic travel related cases for a, a while, um, including in the, in the US. Um, and so that um, wasn't necessarily a cause for alarm. But then on May 14th, um, two additional cases were identified um, in men. Um, these cases had no known connection to that first case and no travel to a country where um, it's thought that travel related impacts might have occurred. But concern really rose, I think, on May 16th when the UK Health Security Agency published this alert about four additional cases, um, three in London, one somewhere else. Um, these had no connection, no known connection to the prior cases. Um, and these cases also had some common contact, uh, contacts, and all of the individuals affected were gay, bisexual, or, uh, or other MSM. Um, and then a day later, this kind of came home to where we practice, where um, a person with MPOX was identified at the hospital that I work at, at Massachusetts General Hospital, and I'll tell you a bit more about that since, or uh, in a few moments. But within days, cases were reported on five continents. Um, and so it was clear that this had spread widely. Um, I suspect that many of you have seen these images from CDC that show the status of the outbreak. This is one from um, last week. 86,000 cases um, in 110 countries, 103 of those being countries that had not historically reported MPOX outside of a few sporadic travel related cases. And Western Europe, the US and Brazil comprise um, a bulk of these cases. Um, but fortunately, things have improved dramatically. Um, so this shows the case trend for MPOX cases from uh, way back in early May um, down to February. And you can see that there's been this long tail, but it, um, cases are now very few and far between. And I believe in Massachusetts, our last cases were in early February. Um, so let's now move to talk about 10, I think, key lessons or, or key information that we learned from this outbreak. And the first, I think, is that in retrospect, conditions really favored a global MPOX outbreak. And I think that there are three main factors here. One um, is the eradication of smallpox. And MPOX is an orthopox virus like smallpox, um, and there is some cross immunity to these viruses. Um, we know that smallpox infection or immunization. <laughs> there's an older study showing that in people who received earlier generation smallpox vaccines in Africa, they had 85% reduction in uh, MPOX even decades later. Um, and so with the eradication of smallpox um, and the cessation of widespread immunization efforts, those stopped in 1972 in the US, and of course the illness was declared eradicated in 1980, this meant um, that there was increasingly over time a population of people who did not necessarily have immunity to orthopox viruses like MPOX. And so one factor here, I think, was limited population immunity to this, uh, this group of viruses. Another factor was that there were actually signals that MPOX was becoming more common um, in some of the places where it had historically been reported. Um, so this shows um, a study from Nigeria in which between 1971 and 1978, there were three cases. And then no reported MPOX for 38 years. And then all the 2017, 88 cases. And there have been cases every year since, um, just eight reported in 2020. That actually may be an artifact because of COVID. Perhaps there was less case reporting or detection at that time. But it's clear that something was different in Nigeria. Um, and there was a physician there named Dr. Demier Ogoina who noticed this and published some papers that I think were incredibly prescient at the time, perhaps not appreciated until now. Uh, but he noted that there were things different about these outbreaks than the classic description of MPOX. 
One is that 81% of the affected people were adults. Previously, 83% were children. 81% um, of affected people were men, um, and it wasn't necessarily clear why there should be this, this gender disparity. Um, and then in contrast to the classic paradigm in which it was thought that people acquired MPOX through contact with animals, maybe through hunting or trapping animals, most of the patients that he was seeing were students or traders or artisans who lived in bustling cities. They didn't necessarily report any contact with animals. And then finally, 50% of people in his case series had genital ulcerations, which were not kind of well described the description of MPOX. Um, and so he, in his 2019 publication, said this, which I think is extraordinarily prescient. He said, although the role of sexual transmission of human monkeypox is not established, it is plausible in some of these patients through close skin-to-skin -skin contact during sexual intercourse or by transmission via genital secretions. And this, I think, has really been borne out in what we've seen in this um, outbreak. And then this um, last factor, I think, is very cliche, but it's worth just noting how incredibly connected the world is. This is a map uh, that I found on Flight Aware on March 1st at 2.20 p.m., a random weekday, just showing the number of flights in the air at that time. The world essentially always looks like this if you look at these flight trackers at any given time, and I think it helps explain why within days there were confirmed cases on five continents with this infection. Um, I think the second key lesson um, is that strong clinical and public health partnerships favored early detection. And I'm going to tell the story here of how um, the first case that we found in our institution was detected, because I think it has some interesting lessons um, for these types of partnerships. This is my colleague, Dr. Nesli Baskos. She is the, uh, the clinical director of infectious disease at Mass General and one of my mentors. Um, and she admitted to her service on May 12th of this past year, a 31-year-old man who had fever, lymphadenopathy, and a very painful penile and perianal rash. And he was actually admitted for pain control. Um, and so between May 12th and May 16th, um, he was given a range of different treatments, a priaxone, doxycycline, acyclovir. He was tested for HSV and VZV had testing for gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis, that kind of ultimately came back negative, and he did not get better um, with the treatments that he was receiving. And in fact, he began to develop spots on other parts of his body. And Dr. Baskos noted that his skin lesions had developed umbilication. And that seemingly small observation was actually very important because she did not expect that with any of the other things on the differential diagnosis at the time. Um, and this case has been reported in the New England Journal um, here are some images of this patient's rash, and you can see the central umbilication there in the um, upper right and also on his finger. So on May 17th, uh, she tells the story that she woke up very early one morning, you know, troubled by, by how to help this patient. And because of this central umbilication in the lesions, she began to think about the possibility of a pox virus. And so she did some internet searches, and she came across that alert that I showed you before of these four other patients in the United Kingdom who were diagnosed with MPOX. Um, her patient, like those patients, was a man who had sex with men. And so um, she reached out to our uh, Associate Chief of Infection Control before 6 a.m. And then by 8 a.m., they were actually on the phone with the state epidemiologist and the medical director of our Bureau of Infectious Disease and Laboratory Sciences. And by that afternoon, our state lab had confirmed um, orthopox virus infection in this patient. And I think, um, you know, the fact that Nestle could call the state and that they would listen to her and, and pursue this testing right off the bat is just an example of how crucial these strong clinical and public health partnerships are, which were really forged for us from the COVID experience. Um, a third key lesson is that the clinical illness of MPOX has really had to be reframed. And if you read about this infection in a textbook in 2021, what you would read about is vastly different from what we are seeing now. Um, as I mentioned before, um, this predominantly affected um, cisgender, gay, bisexual, and other MSM, um, many of whom have HIV, around 40% in initial reports. That proportion is actually a bit higher in the US, above 50%. Concurrent sexually transmitted infections are common in about a third. 
And then um, the symptoms and signs include these here. And I would note that anogenital rash um, occurred in more than 70% of people, um, which uh, kind of similar to what Dr. Ogoina had noted in Nigeria was new in comparison to prior descriptions of this illness. Um, and then there was also evidence of rectal pain and proctitis. I mean, so this shows an example. This is from the New England Journal of, you know, this kind of description of this illness and the new clinical form that we uh, saw beginning in 2022. Another key feature um, that was present both in Dr. Basco's patient and many others is that um, many people did not have a viral prodrome. That had historically been an aspect of this illness. People would get fever, um, they might get malaise, lymphadenopathy, and then develop rash. But in this infection, people often develop the rash first, followed by development of that uh, prodrome or maybe not having the prodrome at all. And we theorize that this is related to the um, mode of acquisition. Um, so people often developed the first lesions at what we think is the site of inoculation, and then perhaps um, subsequently had uh, dissemination of the virus with those more systemic symptoms. Um, of course, not all people affected fell into this epidemiolo epidemiology that I've described. And this is um, one patient we took care of at our institution that initially was almost missed. Um, this patient was a young woman um, who reported no sexual partners, no known contacts with anyone with MPOX, but who came in with this rash on her face. And you can see there, there on day four on, on both cheeks. Um, and you can see as these lesions progressed and became deeply ulcerated and necrotic um, and umbilicated, um, she was ultimately diagnosed with MPOX and treated with picoviramat. Um, and, uh, you can see the photo stretching out to day 44. And after an extensive public health investigation, it's thought that she acquired this infection um, when she went for a massage and, and laid face down on the pillow um, that people put their faces in for, for massage because of this kind of ring distribution of the lesions on her face. Um, a third key lesson that we learned during this outbreak um, is that while most people um, have a fairly uneventful course, um, they recover with supportive care alone, um, that some people can become severely ill. And predominantly, these are people who are immunocompromised, and in particular, people with advanced HIV. These data I'm showing here are from um, 57 severe cases uh, who required hospitalization that were reported to CDC. Um, and you can see that um, 90% uh, of them had some sort of immunocompromising uh, condition, and 83% had HIV. Mucosal lesions, and often very severe mucosal lesions impacting organ function, were present. Um, and uh, about a third required ICU level care from this infection. What are some of the severe manifestations of this illness that we've seen? Um, one is confluent necrotic skin lesions, um, like in that photo towards the middle of the slide, and these can last for weeks to months. Um, another is phimosis and urinary retention. We've seen some secondary bacterial infections a few times actually with lymphangitis spreading up the arm. Um, ocular infections um, have occurred in around six to seven percent of people. Encephalitis, and then in rare cases, disseminated infection with shock and with death. Um, and of the people in this report who had severe illness, um, most of them had advanced HIV with very low CD4 counts, um, and very few of them were on ART at the time of their MPOX diagnosis. And I think this highlights some of the syndemic nature of this infection that, uh, that travels along with STIs and HIV, and of course, in the context of advanced immunosuppression from HIV can lead to these severe manifestations. People with well-controlled HIV seem to fare well, generally, um, like others with this infection. So another key lesson that we learned um, that uh, was different than some of the initial counseling about this infection is that pre-symptomatic transmission occurs. Um, prior to this outbreak, the thought was that people did not transmit the infection when they did not have symptoms. Um, but that didn't fully jive with what we were seeing in clinical practice and in really the kind of very rapid spread of this infection through our clinic. Um, the CDC published various technical reports, and this is one of them, which shows um, the 
the uh, sites and the samples from which MPOX virus DNA can be detected by PCR. There's a fairly long list there. Then a smaller number um, from which replication competent virus has been isolated. Um, and then those that are epidemiologically supported as a source of infection, which is a smaller list. Um, and I would note that um, even though there's insufficient data for um, the contaminated sharp, that there is at least one case in which someone was trying to unroof a vesicle to test pox where um, they had a sharps injury and acquired the infection. Of course, unroofing is not required or recommended if you're just testing for mpox. Um, and these different anatomic sites, they also may differ in the amount of virus that is present. Um, this is a study from France in which people who presented with mpox um, had swabs from multiple sites. And the highest viral loads appear to be in the skin and the anus, um, a little bit less in the throat, and then um, less so in the blood, the urine, and the semen. But after a while, we did have evidence that pre-symptomatic transmission occurs. Um, this is a study that was done in the Netherlands of 109 people. Shown here are 18 people from a single public health agency there who had very detailed uh, public health investigations and in whom um, there was a clear primary case and a secondary case, a person who acquired the infection from the primary case. Um, also good um, evidence in these cases of when the transmission or when the exposure, I should say, likely occurred. And if you focus on those five in red there in the middle of that graph, um, these are people who had um, uh, had an exposure um, before there were symptoms in the primary patient and certainly before there were symptoms in the secondary patient. And so here, um, transmission occurred up to four days um, before the primary patient developed symptoms. As of now, um, we don't have evidence that wholly asymptomatic transmission occurs in which people who never develop symptoms transmit the infection. But we do know that some people who never develop symptoms do actually have detectable MPOX DNA um, at, at certain anatomic sites. Um, I think another key lesson is that community engagement has helped control MPOX in numerous ways, including behavior change, engagement in vaccines, spreading information. Um, of course, um, uh, gay, bisexual, and other MSM communities have a long history of activism. Um, and um, particularly around HIV. And some of the, the protests and activism around MPOX were very similar, I think, to what had been seen in the past as it relates to HIV. I want to look back for a moment at this, um, this case trend to kind of think about and pick apart what may have played a role in the cases actually declining. Um, so you can see that they peaked in early August and then declined since. There are several potential reasons for control of the outbreak. One is immunity through natural infection. We think that after how someone has MPOX, unless they're immunocompromised, they have long lasting immunity. We don't know exactly how long, but we think that immunity is fairly durable. Other possibility, of course, is immunity through vaccination. Um, the vaccine effort really got underway um, in, in uh, mid and late July. And then, of course, behavior change. And this is, I think, one thing that may be underappreciated in terms of MPOX control. Um, but in early August, there was um, data showing that people, affected communities, had reduced their number of sex partners by about half, reduced one-time sexual encounters, um, and also um, reported reductions in sex with people met on dating apps or at venues. And, you know, these behavior changes may not last, but they do seem to have had a substantial impact on MPOX control because if we look at the timing of when the effective reproductive number dropped, um, which is the number of people that someone with the infection um, will subsequently infect, when it drops below one, the outbreak is contracting. Um, and this occurred in late 
there are numerous um, contraindications to ACAM 2000 because of this live replicating virus status. And they're, they're shown here. They include pregnancy, young age, um, immunosuppression, including HIV infection. And remember, 40 to 50 percent of people with MPOX um, and, and potentially at risk for MPOX have HIV. There is also a risk of myocarditis, um, uh, which was a concern um, with uh, the MVABN vaccine, but it's, it's been borne out that that really does not occur at any increased rate. And of course, Geneos only has a single contraindication, which is severe allergy. I want to go um, back in time for a moment and think about what we knew when the outbreak started. Um, and what this gets at, I think, is really the importance of how we message things like vaccines and public health interventions when we have uncertainty, but when we're kind of trying to do the best um, as, a, um, as uh, people involved in public health and clinical care with what we know at the time. Um, the MVABN vaccine was approved by the FDA based on um, having immunologic responses that are similar to ACAM 2000 and having uh, some safety and efficacy data in, in animals. Um, so there had not, it had not been used in an outbreak like this until now. Um, this is uh, a graph showing uh, one of the key studies that contributed to its approval. We knew, for example, that antibody titers in response to this vaccine um, at two weeks were similar between the MVABN vaccine and ACAM 2000 and that peak antibody titers were two weeks after the second dose. And this led to the statement um, that you may have seen that people are considered maximally protected two weeks after their second dose. Uh, but when we were first seeing people for the vaccine, you know, we had to tell them we don't know for sure if this will work, uh, but it's the best we have now. Um, and it was amazing from my perspective, the demand and actually the joy of people who were seeking the vaccine at that time. We um, were one of the first four sites in Massachusetts to have the vaccine to distribute. The amount of vaccine we got on that first day is really laughable. It was 250 doses, um, and they were gone like that um, because people were really lining up to receive the vaccine. Um, our vaccine strategies evolved over time, and I, I want to focus on that too because I think this also gets at um, the messaging around uh, you know, how, we, how we update messages in the setting of an outbreak and still try to maintain the trust of the communities we're seeking to serve. So our first strategies were post-exposure prophylaxis, PEPT vaccine. Um, and the, the kind of uh, most traditional form of this was vaccinating people who were identified as having a confirmed exposure to MPOX through public health investigation, through contact tracing, and so forth. Now, why would this be effective? Well, there's evidence from the smallpox eradication era that these ring vaccine strategies and post-exposure vaccine strategies could be effective. And so we thought that it might be effective for this as well. And then soon after that, um, a PEP++ strategy was added on. And this is for people who were presumed to have exposure to MPOX, but it wasn't known for sure. Um, so this included people who um, had a sex partner within the past 14 days who'd been diagnosed, people with multiple sex partners, people who had sex at commercial venues, and so forth. And then, um, as the vaccine supply improved, um, we moved to pre-exposure vaccination, or PrEP. The CDC had some eligibility criteria, and then uh, different um, states and jurisdictions could improvise a bit on those. And so these are the criteria we had in Massachusetts, which are extraordinarily broad. Um, so for example, uh, MSM and transgender and gender diverse people who'd had an STI or even sought testing for one in the past year. People who were eligible for PrEP, who'd had more than one sex partner, um, people who'd had sex at commercial venues, who'd had sex partners with those risks, or who simply thought they were eligible for MPOX vaccine. You didn't have to say why, you just had to say, I think I'm eligible, and then you could get the vaccine. Um, now, as um, many of you, I think, are aware, there was a shift to intradermal dosing um, with the goal being to increase vaccine supply. That happened on August 9th. Um, and I'm not sure what your experiences were like here, but we had a very kind of rapid process of figuring out how to implement this in our clinic. The rationale for intradermal dosing um, was that antibody responses, and again, that's the whole reason the vaccine had been approved in the beginning anyway, 
uh, not based on clinical endpoints, but on immunologic responses, that those um, to intradermal dosing were non-inferior to those of subcutaneous dosing. But the intradermal route required just one-fifth of the subcutaneous dose. And so this, of course, would stretch the vaccine supply. And so this then emerged as the preferred approach for those who were 18 years of age or older and had no history of keloids. There was a concern that perhaps um, giving the vaccine intradermally might cause keloids, although there's actually not a lot of evidence that that's the case. Um, and I think, you know, one thing um, uh, that um, was, was very good around this time is that there was also concern about the potential impact of stigma on vaccine acceptance. The intradermal administration, which was typically given on the forearm like a tuberculin skin test, can cause a fairly long-lasting inflammatory reaction with pain and swelling and even skin changes that last for days to weeks. Um, and, you know, there was concern that some people didn't want to walk around with potentially a mark um, that they had received the Impox vaccine. And so other sites were um, ultimately used for that vaccine. And so to take a step back for a moment, um, in a very short period of time, our vaccine strategy evolved greatly. We began uh, with a small amount of vaccine, giving subcutaneous administration with a plan for two doses, just like the way that the um, uh, vaccine was approved. And we only did this as PEP or PEP++. Then we in Massachusetts and in many other places moved to a first dose prioritization scheme. And this was the idea that we'll give as many people as possible one dose and defer the second dose until their supply. This was not recommended by CDC, but it was thought to be a good way to stretch the vaccine supply. And there was some indication that a single dose still, stood, uh, still uh, provided um, some protection. Then um, with the switch to intradermal, we were back to giving two doses to everyone, but again, just under PEP and PEP++ circumstances. And um, then later on, adding on PrEP to that. And more recently, of course, um, because vaccine supply permits, um, people can kind of choose which vaccine administration route they want. Um, they can get subcutaneous or intradermal. And so, um, you know, this of course was a large logistical undertaking, but I think the main point to take away here is that I was very worried as this, this was happening that we would lose trust. We had changed so many times what we were doing that people would just lose faith um, in the vaccine effort. And I, there undoubtedly were some who did. Uh, but I think with careful messaging and, and messaging about what we know and don't know and why we're changing, that it can be successful. Um, and in our state, we think uh, that about 82% of eligible people have been vaccinated. Of course, 18% haven't, um, but the majority have. Uh, there's several lines of evidence that also show, um, I think, that this vaccine is, in fact, effective. Um, I'm showing some examples here of different studies. This is from data presented at the uh, Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices recently um, and shows uh, the predicted efficacy of both um, one dose of the vaccine and two doses, um, with both being effective but two doses appearing to be more effective. Um, with uh, reduction in impacts between 66 and 89%. Um, of course, we also know that vaccine administration um, was not equitable, um, and there were disparities by race and ethnicity that did not match the case distributions. Um, on the um, left-hand side here are the, um, the di distribution by race and ethnicity of uh, people with impox. And it's about a third, a third, a third of um, white, Hispanic, or Latino, and black or African American. And um, the, um, on the right-hand side, you can see the um, vaccine recipients by race and ethnicity, um, where 52% were white and smaller proportions were Hispanic um, or Latino and black. Um, and in response to this, many jurisdictions and, um, and the CDC um, funded vaccine equity efforts to provide vaccine at community locations, on mobile vans, at um, large public events. Um, that has helped some, but I think one lesson that we can take away from this is the importance of thinking about equitable distribution from the get-go and not kind of then, you know, seeing the problem and, and responding, um, reacting. Um, disparities by race and ethnicity are actually less pronounced for MPOX treatment. And so when people acquired the infection and, and did need treatment, um, the distribution was actually uh, much more representative of the distribution of people who had the infection. Um, and so 
it's about um, a third, a third, a third year of um, white, Hispanic, or Latino, and black, non Hispanic, in terms of people who received Chico Biramon, the main antiviral that's been used. Um, so, my next lesson, I think, is, um, is an unfortunate one. And that is that despite this outbreak and all the cases that we've had, we really still don't know if Chico Biramont or TPOX works. Um, I'll pause for a moment and just talk about the cornerstones of MPOX treatment. Um, the first is pain management uh, as a key component of supportive care, along with treating concurrent STIs and or HIV if that's indicated. Um, and then there are what have been called medical countermeasures um, or antiviral treatments for severe disease or people who are at risk for severe disease. And these include brin which is available via a single patient IND, vaccinia immune globulin. But the one that I'm going to focus on is ticobiramod because that's the primary one um, that we used during this outbreak. Um, this works by blocking secondary viral envelope formation. And prior to this outbreak, it was FDA approved under what's called the animal rule for the treatment of smallpox in adults and children. And what that means is that its approval was based on human safety studies and animal and hum, uh, animal safety and efficacy studies, but not human efficacy studies, because it would not be um, uh, feasible or ethical to do a study of smallpox uh, treatment for that. Um, so, of course, it's not FDA approved for MPOX or for other orthopox viruses. And so it became available during this outbreak through an expanded access IND protocol. And I suspect that many of you were involved in providing Ticoviramont in this fashion. It became uh, progressively easier to do so over time. It was initially um, fairly administratively burdensome. But I think in a setting like this, there is a need to balance compassionate use of these medications that may work for people with severe disease, with also having a randomized evaluation of the efficacy. And I'm not sure that we've gotten that balance right with ticobiramat and MPOX. Um, so currently, um, you could use ticobiramat under the IND for people with severe disease, confluent lesions, sepsis, encephalitis, and so forth. And in fact, um, uh, there are recently published interim considerations for uh, treatment of people with severe disease that include primarily ticoviramod, but also some of the other strategies. Also, involvement of anatomic areas that have the possibility of serious sequelae or scarring, um, and those are shown here. And then it could also be considered for people with a high risk for severe disease who aren't manifesting it yet, and some of those examples um, are shown there. And, you know, early on, um, when these criteria were actually even more permissive, many people were eligible for TPOX because having genital and anogenital lesions would potentially be a qualification. And we saw earlier how more than 70% of people had such lesions um, at the time of their diagnosis. Um, so, uh, you know, um, we, and I imagine you and many others across the uh, country provided a lot of ticoviramat via IND. Um, we had more than 60 patients we treated at, at MGH with ticoviramat. Um, I, Heard that in the city of New York, they treated more patients with this drug than were ever included in any of the studies that led to the approval of that medication. Um, and then a trial called STOMP um, was launched to, to try to um, assess in a randomized fashion whether this treatment actually works. And the primary outcome here was, um, was uh, clinical resolution. Um, there were three arms, um, active ticoviramat, placebo, and then an open label arm for people with severe infections. But the STOM trial started kind of on the tail end of this curve. And so it's been challenging to enroll uh, subjects into that study. Um, and so far, enrollment is far below what I think is hoped to be able to answer this question. Um, you know, it, it does take a long time to get these trials up and running. But I think, you know, in, in the context of this current outbreak, it may be challenging to figure out in this mechanism if ticoviramod actually works, and maybe some strategies to combine data from STOMP with data from some other studies, including one in the UK, to try to get um, at an answer. Um, my last key lesson, I think, is that MPOX really highlighted the role of STI and HIV clinics and programs in outbreak response. 
programs often have low thresholds for access. Um, they're easy to get into, and they're often used to caring for patients um, who may uh, not otherwise be able to pay or to have health insurance. Um, they often, I think, have high degrees of trust within the community. They have expertise in identifying and treating co-occurring STIs. And I think many of us who do uh, work in the HIV and STI space kind of realize early on, this I think is going to be a big deal for our clinics uh, because we already see people with genital ulcerations. Um, and so you know, now we're going to have to, um, to understand how to assess for this condition as well. Um, these programs have comfort eliciting sexual histories and contact tracing, partner notification, all of which were important as part of their response to MPOX. And there are often embedded disease intervention specialists and field epidemiologists, all in Massachusetts, field epis, who can help with um, the contact tracing, um, which was uh, a key part of the initial response to this outbreak. Many unanswered questions that remain. Um, one is when they rise again. I think some people think that perhaps they'll go up in the summer. Does asymptomatic transmission occur? We have pretty good evidence that pre-symptomatic transmission occurs, but people who never manifest symptoms also transmit the virus. We don't know. Um, another one is how long-lasting is immunity after natural infection? Um, based on some data from Africa, it appears to be very long-lived, but we don't know for sure. And of course, that may be different in someone who was immunocompromised when they acquired the infection. What about uh, how durable is immunity after vaccination? Uh, with the kind of pre-outbreak approval of Geneos for laboratory workers um, and other personnel who might interact with orthopox viruses, they would get a booster every two years. And we don't know if that's warranted or not. Um, and then what is the best vaccination strategy going forward? Um, we are continuing to vaccinate kind of based on those criteria I showed you in Massachusetts. Although at this point, we're predominantly kind of finding people who come for another reason and we realize they're eligible and so give them the vaccine. Um, if the uh, infection doesn't ever rebound, then it, it doesn't really matter. Um, but given that you know, ability, we're, we're continuing our vaccination strategy uh, right now. Um, I think the hope is that, that um, this vaccine will become more widely available in retail pharmacies and so forth. It's not the case uh, in Massachusetts right now. Um, so um, I think that limited immunity in the post smallpox eradication era really set the stage for our MPOX outbreak. That close collaboration between frontline clinicians and public health professionals was really crucial in this outbreak and probably any outbreak. Um, this current form of NPOX differs substantially from classic descriptions, and severe disease can occur in the setting of immunocompromise. Um, and it was interesting to see um, uh, kind of all of us wrestle with kind of defining this new clinical syndrome as we were seeing the data in real time. There were several times in our own work where we had to change our messaging around vaccines. You know, now we're doing intradermal. Now we're doing one dose. Now we're back to doing two doses. And I think we have to be nimble and humble in conveying known and not known. And that kind of humility um, and, and acknowledgement of uncertainty is actually crucial for effective messaging. Community engagement around behavior change and vaccination played a substantial role in controlling this infection, with behavior change, I think, playing a major part um, before the vaccination effort really got off the ground. And then outbreak response efforts should include equity considerations from the very beginning. Um, and then finally, um, you know, I'm not sure that we will know if Tifoviramat works or not, uh, despite you know all that has happened. And so I think that we need to think about how to best balance compassionate use of unproven therapies and rigorous assessments of their use uh, of their efficacy going forward. So I want to thank you for that. Oh more comment actually about um, just the STI and the HIV public health infrastructure, which I think is truly indispensable in this and highlights um, uh, one of the values of that infrastructure. So I want to thank you for your attention and we have plenty of time for questions and comments and so I would love to hear your questions.
questions or comments, or even comments about your experience here. Very nice talk, um, and really thank you for coming. Um, it really highlights a lot of the issues that we have here. So, so I have a question. Um, so, all of us who are in infectious disease, were fortunately because of our um, public prominence since COVID, were asked about this next potential pandemic as far as monkey and they, we were a lot torn a lot because of the whole issues of risks groups and stigma and how to communicate those kinds of things um, to the population. Um, and um, this is something, you know, for me, who an older physician who went through the whole thing with HIV, you know, these are all since things that we were um, sensitive about. So how, how did you handle, you know, obviously the MSM, community was the most affected, but it's, there were many other people who got it. And there were a lot of sort of, you didn't want to stigmatize people, but you wanted to get to and educate the most at risk people. Um, and then obviously, if those community organizations hadn't mobilized in a productive way, it probably wouldn't have been curtailed. So, so how do you handle those kinds of things in a, in a very, fraught situation where you don't want to stigmatize people, but you also do want to reach the people most at risk who may also have some wariness about the healthcare system. That is an excellent question and was a, you know, daily consideration, I think, you know, early on in the course of this outbreak. Um, I think there are a few things. I mean, one, I think you, 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 you have to say what the data show. And, and I think it was actually really, really important to say that um, cisgender, gay, bisexual, and other MSM are predominantly affected by this outbreak and to reach out to, um, to people in those communities and champions in those communities and organizations serving those communities to share information um, and, and provide that information. But also it's important to convey that anyone can get this infection. And so we tried to strike the balance in our messaging early on about you know, this group is being most affected right now, but anyone could acquire this infection. I think um, you know you raised the issue of of stigma, and I think that there are things um, that were done or that maybe could have been done differently to try to reduce stigma. Um, one example of that is um, you know some uh, vaccine uh, sites initially offered the vaccine on kind of a walk-in, first-come, first-served basis, which is understandable in the setting of a very limited resource. But you then also saw these lines of people around the block who were there for the MPOX vaccine. And if you knew who was eligible at the time, you could kind of put two and two together. And so it made me think about, well, who doesn't want to show up in that line? Um, so, you know, we, for example, tried to have, um, you know, appointment only vaccine, um, which of course has its own downsides, um, but trying to make it as easy as possible to come in and not have to stand in one of those lines, I think is one approach. Um, and then another, I think, um, really key aspect of the stigma piece um, is that um, in the vaccine effort, um, you know, ultimately we said that really anyone who thinks they might be at risk can come get the vaccine. You don't have to tell us your sexual history or uh, what venue you went to or something like that because some people may not feel comfortable sharing that information. So, you know, indicating who is eligible, but also that if you just think you're eligible, please come. I think could also help limit the impact of stigma on those efforts. Brenda, thank you again for an amazing talk. And I think you're highlighting the public health partnership with any institution, whether it be other governmental or you know, private sector is, is key. Uh, just a comment and a question. One of the interesting things that worked well for us in the VA system is we were at, had the luxury of having the information of everyone in our PrEP program and everyone who's living with HIV. Um, so we were able to do targeted messaging um, to everyone. So it wasn't based actually on gender identity at all. It was anybody with a, a B20 diagnosis and anybody with a B20.6 you know, diagnosis. And then I think that helped, I think, decrease stigma because we're offering this to everyone. And that also helped in our priority as well. And we did a combination, I think, to our credit of a appointment and a walk-in. So we first did appointments and um, we had a wonderful partnership with our scheduling and our primary care doctors who were able to get that and also destigmatize it because it was through primary care as well. Um, so it wasn't just an ID-centric uh, effort. Um, so I think that helped bring people into the system who might have not even been in our ID clinics who thought they were at, at risk. But I should say that's, that's excellent what we've all done and it was really good to hear those experiences. 
a great talk. One of the things that when you've been doing infectious disease, like I have for the last 10 years, no, it's been like 40 years, yeah, a little longer. Uh, okay, I don't know the quote. The dinosaurs were around when I started, so it's okay. It's, it's intriguing um, when you're looking at the pushback with lots of vaccines that we see, why this was accepted by a population who's at risk. And one of the things I think that strikes is pain is an inducer to try and prevent getting a disease that can cause significant pain, just like shingles vaccine. Um, so that was one thing that I think was probably a very interesting thing to communicate and seems to have worked quite well. Uh, I am interested in your all's experience now with uh, what are the predominant routes of vaccination are you doing? Are you doing sub-Q or still intradermal? Or um, have you seen a preference? Is there anything you can do? And the other question is, uh, are you going to do follow-up? Uh, is someone going to do follow-up? And look at durability. So two excellent questions. The first was, um, you know, what are we doing now with vaccination in terms of intradermal sub-Q? Um, so we, um, we offer people the choice. I would say that, that many are choosing intradermal, the majority actually. It's, it's uncommon that we do a sub-Q vaccine, even though people have the choice. I mean, as I mentioned before, right now we're mostly vaccinating people who come for another reason. Um, they're not seeking it out like they were early on, but they're there for PrEP, they're there for STI testing, and, you know, we suggest a vaccine. And, you know, again, these are people who are in care for something, but it's rare that there is pushback. You know, people, when we recommend it or offer it, people, you know, generally accept it. Um, you know, I, I personally don't have plans to look at the durability, but I, I hope someone does, and I think, I, you know, I, I do believe that's planned, but I think that's really important to find out. Um, I should mention, you know, that it does seem that two doses are um, more effective than one, but there is some substantial benefit from a single dose. We are still finding people who kind of got one and then they fell off, you know, uh, but they're amenable to the second one when they come back in. Um, there was a recent NMWR that showed that even people who got one dose and acquired MPOX um, were actually less likely to have hospitalization. They had fewer systemic symptoms, which makes sense. The, the vaccine attenuated the severity of the infection. Um, my question is, um, in terms of like the risk factors that were noted to lead to like the emergence of NPOX again, these risk factors exist in a lot of communities across the world, but why did UK and the US become like the place where the outbreak happened and it was just limited to these areas. Like what, what makes the UK and US different from other countries, even though the other risk factors remain the same? You know, I'm not sure that they're necessarily different. It, it may be, um, and ultimately this, um, this uh, you know, outbreak was detected in 110 countries um, across the world, multiple continents. You know, it may just have been that um, that those happen to be settings where um, the, the clinical care and the public health infrastructure allowed for early detection. But, you know, if you look at the, the kind of sequence of when we started to report their first case, and of course, maybe they started to look harder, you know, once they knew about it, it elsewhere, um, you know, uh, it was those cases in, in the UK, um, and then, you know, us on May 17th, New York City, the following day, I mean, um, I think Australia was May 20th. I mean, it was very, very uh, almost concurrent. Any comments on any other like off-label treatments for MPOX, like sildenafil and the efficacy, or is it similar to TPOX? And is there any other like other? Um, so I think we know even less about the other treatments than we do about ticoviramot. Um, so sildenafil um, and you know brinsidofavir are thought to work similarly. Um, sildenafil is of course commercially available. Um, and uh, you know there are I think rare circumstances where people receive that drug often in combination with ticoviramot, or if ticoviramot was not an option because of intolerance or, or um, lack of improvement. Um, you know, one of the other medical countermeasures that are um, mentioned for consideration are trifluridine eye drops. 
people with ocular infection, I think the efficacy of those is not fully known either. Um, but that is one possibility for infection at that site. Um, beyond those, um, you know, I'm not aware of, of other treatments that, um, that were used in any kind of substantial way um, in the part of this outbreak, but of others in other treatments. Any other questions or comments? Yes, yes. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? I, I, you mentioned you that, that and, and pox transmission is primarily skin to skin and genital secretions, especially in the genital area, skin to skin contact. But is there any evidence at all of respiratory um, transmission? I didn't hear that. Can you ask state the question one more time? Respiratory transmission. So, um, as I understand it, um, Thought to be possible, but not the primary mode of transmission. Okay. So it is possible. There's there is some evidence then. As I understand the evidence, so that you know, it is possible that um, that impox can be acquired by the respiratory route. I, I don't think we think of it as an airborne infection, um, but. Um, uh, that does not appear to be the primary mode of transmission. In okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Right. 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 And I mean, it's probably difficult to separate, you know, respiratory and skin to skin um, exposure, fomite exposure, and so forth in many of these scenarios. So, you know, there there is a um, uh, prior to this outbreak, there was a scenario of someone who acquired. Impox nosocomally from a, they were kind of shaking the, the linens of someone who had had impox. You know, was that because they were touching the linens? Was it because of you know uh, inhalation um, of particles? You know, I think hard to say for sure. Yeah, so, so the question was, you know, what do you think about kind of localized disease versus disseminated disease? And I, I would say, you know, we saw a broad uh, array, but I would say the most common pattern that we saw is that someone had genital or perianal or perioral lesions, primarily. Those are the first ones that arose. They were the most severe, often the biggest. Um, maybe they subsequently had a fever and felt unwell. Maybe not, often not. And then they developed a few other spots that were less severe on their body. So kind of some evidence of dissemination, but primarily uh, that kind of local, presumably site of inoculation was the main site affected. Um, most people in this outbreak have had fewer than 10 impox lesions. Um, so if that kind of gets at, at, at you know, some idea of the extent of dissemination, Thank you so much for being with us.